so I'd like to introduce you to our two wonderful guests. Uh, over here on the, my far right, we have Karen Hitchcock, who has written the most wonderful quarterly essay um, on caring for the elderly in our public hospitals, and it's called Dear Life on Caring for the Elderly. Um, she's also a regular contributor to the monthly magazine, and she's also the author of an award-winning short story collection, and she's a general physician at a major public hospital in Melbourne. Yeah, the Alfred. So, a pretty high achiever, as is our next guest. <laughs> Lisa Genova, who many of you will know as the author of Still Alice, which she, I didn't realise this until I, until I started researching you, self-published in the beginning, before it was picked up by a major publisher. Yeah. Very brave. Uh, she's also the author of Left Neglected, Love Anthony, and her latest book, Inside the O'Briens, which is also a wonderful read. Uh, but she's also one of these fabulous overachievers because she had a first career before she became a writer. She has a PhD in neuroscience from Harvard University and spent many years um, working in medical research labs. Is that right? Yep. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> and my name is Kirsty Melville and I present a program called Earshot on ABC Radio National, which is a documentary style program. So it's a real treat for me to be able to see my audience instead of just imagining them out there through the, through the wireless. Okay, so both of you tell really lovely stories about caring for your grandmothers when they were old and when they were dying. Can you start, Karen, by telling me about your experience with your nana? Yeah, my grandmother. So she was my main maternal uh, care figure in my life and uh, an incredibly powerful, independent woman, very strong role model for me as I was growing up because she was widowed and my parents were too busy to look after me, so I used to hang around with her. And uh, I wasn't, you know, I was clever enough, but I wasn't a very good student and then did a half asked arts degree part-time and then eventually decided to study medicine and she was so proud uh, you know so proud she'd tell people anyone who would listen like <laughs> the people <laughs> the man at the grocery store you know, this is my granddaughter <laughs> she's going to be a doctor and uh, but when I was a medical student she got really sick and so uh, she had pulmonary fibrosis, which is when your lungs all fibros up and, you know, over a very short period of time, she'd gone from being this, uh, you know, really powerful uh, woman who ran a farm. She didn't live on the farm, but she ran a farm and bossed everyone around uh, to being um, tethered to an oxygen machine uh, and housebound. Now, she still loved her life and still very much wanted to live and... Uh, she got sick at one point when I was a very junior medical student and was hospitalised and for a chest infection. And it was sort of uh, one, one of the experiences that I had as a very junior medical student on the ward with her that was probably the inspiration for the quarterly essay that I wrote. And uh, do you want me to tell that story? Yeah. So, um, so it was late at night and I was with her... Um, as I was most of the time, and uh, her uh, IV drip blocked up and needed to be, uh, she needed to have another one put in, and so they called the resident, the junior doctor on the ward, to come and do it. And he was sort of horrified by the idea that uh, a woman of this age and decrepitude would be being treated and assumed that it was um, wrong and futile despite the fact that he was a woman who still felt her life had meaning and really wanted to live. And so he sent me out of the room and I overheard him saying to her as he was, you know, repeatedly trying to get this needle in her arm, oh, you poor thing, we know this is cruel, it's so terrible. And so that just really stuck with me because I'm sure that he thought he was trying to be compassionate and empathetic, but really what he was being was judgmental and I felt really ashamed really ashamed and guilty at the time because he was, you know, much higher up in the hierarchy and medicine's very hierarchical. And she ended up dying in a hospice 
which was actually a really beautiful experience besides the grief of losing this very important woman because it was this really quiet place and uh, you know all of her physical needs were attended to by the nurses and uh, they would just allow me to come in every day and slip into bed with her you know and read my textbooks it was very it remains a very important um, experience in my life one I won't forget just having the physical comfort of her body and being able to give her that comfort as well and I think that that sort of uh, has informed my 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 ethics in my job the whole way along and that's the potted story of my grandma <laughs> I love that story because it shows you know the, the deep compassion you felt for your grandmother it clearly translates into your writing and the way that you are with the patients that you treat in your in your work daily um, and I'll come back to some of the issues that are raised by that by that story too a bit later. But Lisa, why um, did you? How much did your experience, your grandmother's experience uh, of of living with Alzheimer's, affect your decision to write Still Alice? So my experience with my grandmother's why I wrote Still Alice. So my grandmother was formally diagnosed with Alzheimer's when she was 85. She'd probably had symptoms of the disease for 10 years prior to that. And none of us, I mean, she has nine, nine children. I'm like the 27th grandchild. I mean, there's, a, and we all lived nearby. So it wasn't like, and my grandfather died back when I was seven, and she did live alone. She was very independent and strong and um, just an amazing woman. So, it's not like we didn't see what was going on, but I think our family is like a lot of families in that we assumed that forgetting was a normal part of normal aging, and we were in a bit of denial because no one wants to see this happen to someone that you love. So, so by the time she was diagnosed, she was actually pretty far along into the disease. So, you know, we'd noticed that she was leaving the keys in the door and the tea kettle on the burner, and she couldn't do the checkbook anymore, and she was cheating at bridge, and... <laughs> <laughs> not a sign of Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the thing that happened was she walked to the bowling alley at four in the morning, thinking it was the middle of the day, wondering where her bowling team was. And it was this disorientation. I mean, we couldn't, like, the whole trip to the bowling alley and then the aftermath of it, she couldn't quite get oriented to time and, and, and what was going on. And so, so she was diagnosed, and we as a family showed up to take care of her. And primarily, so she's five daughters and four sons, and it was primarily the daughters who showed up to take care of her. And, you know, ironically, my grandmother's, like, the typical Italian mother. Like, so the daughters are the ones there taking care of her, and she forgot all of her daughters before she forgot any of her sons. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. Truly. So, so I'm the neuroscientist in this big family, and you know, we're all wrestling with how to go through this, and you know, everybody's going through the stages of grief because we're, you know, we're upset about this, and it's, you're losing the relationship that you've had with her for something new. And so, you know, we're all in different phases. Some of the aunts and uncles are in denial and some are in anger and bargaining and despair and acceptance. And you get them all in the same room to like, what do we do and how do we do this? And it's hard to have a coherent conversation when everyone's in a different emotional place. But I'm a neuroscientist, so I'll go learn everything about Alzheimer's and pass that education along to everyone so we can be better caregivers and stay connected to her. Because like, in an, the absence of a cure, I think that's what we all really want is to stay connected. And, and she's you know, losing access to her memories and personal history and the reasons, the ways in which she were connected. And so how do we do that? So I, I began by reading the science, which is like a silly thing to have done, but like I you know, quickly understood the molecular neurobiology or the current understanding of the molecular neurobiology of Alzheimer's, which didn't help anyone. <laughs> um, and then I went into the nonfiction books like The 36-Hour Day and a lot of self-help books. And while these were helpful, I recognized that at one point that everything was written by the point of view of an outsider. So we got the clinician's point of view and the scientists and the caregivers and the social workers. But what about the person who has it? And this wasn't just some sort of like self-righteous question. It was while I was with my grandmother and she would, you know, try to breastfeed plastic baby dolls or like just not understand us and get lost in the bathroom. And it, it, I kept asking, what does it feel like to have this? Because she's a really smart woman. Um, and like, yeah, so there was 
one really funny quick story is like she always she was very smart and she still believed she was smart like to the day she died which in some ways was very funny because she you know she had lost so much intellect like it didn't make sense so the daughters decided my aunts decided to take her to Rome one last time where and she's in the window seat and she looks out the window and she says what's that up there and my aunt looks out and she says oh that's the engine mom that's part of the engine to the plane she says oh it looks like a little car and 30 seconds later oh what's that out there it's the engine it looks like a little car they did this like a dozen times at least before my grandmother for, 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 forgot about this went to sleep they land in Rome she looks out the window and she goes huh that little car kept up with us the whole way <laughs> And I love that, because she was like, I'm smart, I know that's a car. Um, <laughs> so why so, did you... So, so what does it feel like to have this? It was so unanswerable to me, I couldn't understand it, and that di created so much distance for me, I could not connect with my grandmother, I had no idea how to do it. I was unnerved, baffled, heartbroken, distanced. And I wanted to know what does it feel like to have this from her perspective, and because she was so far along into the disease by the time we even showed up, she couldn't answer that question for me. So my idea at the time, and this was back in 1998, I was like, fiction is a place where you can walk in someone else's shoes, where you can explore someone else's perspective. And I thought, well, someday I'll write a book about Alzheimer's and I'll, I'll write a novel about Alzheimer's and tell it from her perspective. And really thought I would do that someday when I was retired and as a hobby. And I didn't imagine that it would be a new career. but things happened. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. So why did you make the decision to have Alice's character um, experiencing early onset Alzheimer's as opposed to being elderly? Yeah. So in doing the research for this book, I, you know, I started in the medical community and so I shadowed neurologists and sat in on neuropsych testing and um, interviewed general practice physicians and genetic counselors, but the real experts were the people who have it. So I came to know 27 people who have young onset Alzheimer's who I was in touch with every day while writing this book. And these people are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. And as I came to know them and, and appreciated the enormity of what they were sharing with me, I recognized that, that they're not included in what typically gets talked about when we talk about Alzheimer's. I think our general conception of this disease is that this is a disease of the dying elderly. And while those folks deserve our re respect and attention and dignity, there are also all these other millions of people who are trying to live with Alzheimer's. Like, what does that look like, sound like, feel like? And um, so I, I wanted to give this crowd a face and a voice. And you did it beautifully. We'll come back to that. Um, and so, Karen, you write so powerfully about the way the elderly are perceived in hospitals. And quite frankly, it's a bit horrific. Some of the names that are, are given to the elderly, and one that particularly bothered me, was Crumbles. Mm. Can you explain where that has come from and why? Uh, so, um, I guess a med there's a medical term that's called crashing. So if you're if you're uh, if you get if you have a heart attack and your suddenly your heart can't pump enough blood uh, to you know uh, the blood that your body needs, then you'd be considered crashing. So if you need someone to come in and pump intravenous fluid, take you to ICU and tube you and give you inotropes and keep your everything working, then you're crashing. And uh, the majority of people who come to hospital now aren't really crashing. They're just you know, slowly declining, and the word that, so that's, they're crumbling, I guess that's where that word comes from, but they're called crumbles, or um, in the UK, famously, they're called gomers, which stands for get out of my emergency room. So, um, and the, uh, is traditionally that, is that used these... often? Hmm? Pardon? Is that used often? Crumbles... Yes, or, or goma, gomas? I don't know, not in Australia. They wouldn't really uh, be conscionable in Australia. But uh, crumbles, yeah, I would say crumble. It's a crumble. Or um, a granny dump happens at Christmas time when a family can't look after their elderly family member anymore or wants to go to Fire and Bay or something. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of derogatory terms. But, I mean, the, the words, if you change the words, that doesn't really matter because... Really, it just uh, highlights the sort of 
um, the priority that were given to these patients who were the majority of the patients that were coming into the hospital. It was like the, the lowest. I mean, when I, when I finished my specialist exam, so you do your specialist exams, then you have to choose what specialty you're going to do in internal medicine. So you can do neurology, cardiology, nuclear medicine, whatever. The lowest thing that you could do was uh, acute and general medicine, which is what I do now. And really, there are about 40 trainees in Australia, and these are the physicians who look after not only old people, but probably 60% of our patients are elderly people with multi-organ failure who are, you know, come into hospital once or twice a year and then gradually decline. And uh, they were the lowest priority. And so if you came into the emergency department as as an old person with, you know, a urine infection and a bit of heart failure, a bit of shorter breath because of that, and a bit delirious. You'd sit in the ED for 24 hours or more because, you know, there's people having heart attacks, like real problems happening. That you know, and it's you know, people who were dying. So a couple of years ago, the government uh, instituted this um, four-hour rule. So now, in any public emergency department, the emergency department needs to get the majority of their patients seen and either up to the ward or home within four hours. And that has resulted in this, you know, marked decline in mortality of elderly patients, which I just think is unbelievable. Like, it's so wonderful. It, that four-hour rule was a complete nightmare for every public hospital in Australia because it, it just... It, it, uh, in, to institute that invo meant that there had to be enormous changes in the way hospitals worked. And integral to that working was the development of general medical departments so that a patient who had lots of things going on or who d didn't have a diagnosis yet had to go up to the ward and be put into the hands of physicians who could do what needed to be done and diagnose the patient. And so that general medicine just blossomed and uh, now we have more trainees than any other specialty, thank God, because, you know, this is the demographic of patients. You know, this is what patients look like now and so we need doctors to treat those patients and uh, so that's that's sort of changed I think the, there has been a shift in the last you know five or ten years in Australia about the the status of the general physician and also the way that those patients are treated. You still write very strongly, though, in your quarterly essay, I, I'm assuming, about contemporary situations of, um, I guess, if, if, if elderly people just not really being taken seriously in the system, um, that they, they tend to be, you know, put into one of three groups. They're either cute, cute. <laughs> or difficult or unresponsive. Mute, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, oh, look, I, I think that that's still the case. Uh, What's cute? Cute is, um, uh, okay, so you, it's really easy to be cute if you're old. You just um, say anything that any normal human being would say and then that's considered cute. So, like, it's, I mean, I, I first heard about the explanation, because people say it all the time on the woods, oh, you know, this 95-year-old woman has come in after tripping over, after changing her cat litter, and she's so cute. And the, the junior doctors who say it don't say it to be, you know, cruel. They don't think they're being condescending. They think they're being nice, you know, by mm. calling this patient cute. But th there was a website that I saw from the United States run by, um, I don't know, a group of older women called Grumpy Old Ladies or something. And they, they wrote in their website, they, they said, why do people call you cute? The reason they call you cute is that you say something that any person would say, and because you're old, they think it's cute. And it's, I think it's really true. Like, as if we don't expect an old person, which somehow we don't realise is us in the future, that we don't expect that they would actually be able to have an opinion on something or say anything at all. So... It's not difficult. hard to be cute. I assume difficult is just demanding Difficult is when treatment. you actually would like to know what the hell's going mm -hmm. on or have some say in it. So difficult. Difficult means you don't agree with what I, what I reckon should happen or you just ask too many questions. Mute is when you just like have given up and just like, do what you want. <laughs> I'm so tired and sick. Mm. Lisa, do you know, do you know if, you, if you see similar ageist attitudes in hospitals in the States? Yeah, I mean, so it's, 
I'm trying to think of the, so I, I've written about Huntington's and I'm, I'm researching a book about ALS right now, Alzheimer's, but I was with the early onset crowd. The people I, who I am around who are approaching end of life tend to be a lot younger. Um, so they are, it's, it's a different crowd. Um, but in terms of what I know of the US, I, I very serendipitously just read Being Mortal by Atul Gawande on the, on the way here. Have you read him yet? Yes. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. And it's, uh, we don't have it figured out either. We have the same biases and prejudices and this idea of, of um, treating anything that can be fixed so, and, and, and not sort of evaluating sort of quality of life and, and, and have it being in conversation with every patient to understand what, is, what it is that you want and the, the, uh, the benefits and the risks to any treatment and how that might weigh the ultimate outcome of what that pa individual patient wants. Um, and that end of life is, is not something that we can ultimately avoid. And so what do you want that to look like? Do you want to mm -hmm. be in the hospital um, it, treated to the nth degree? Do you want to be in hospice at home? Like th mm -hmm. These conversations people are so afraid to have. And so then we have doctors who don't know the patient's wishes doing the best that they can. Um, but the, ultimately, often getting in situations where um, it pr probably isn't in the, in the best interest of the patient's well-being. Yes, mm. I'm going to come a bit later to talking about advanced care directives that features quite heavily in Karen's piece. Um, I, I guess one of the things that Karen talks about is that there is a tendency to um, consider an elderly person or a person at end of life's condition futile. Treatment would be futile. So they're in the public system there is less willingness to treat. And I'm wondering if it, I actually wonder whether it might be the opposite in the States, yeah. because that you're working on that free market health system um, and, and doctors has, you know, they stand to gain by over-treating. Is that an issue, the, uh, the opposite Yeah, I think issue. we have an opposite issue where there's over-treatment. And then the other thing that tends to happen with the elderly though is that, that we don't ask them for what they want directly, we ask the children um, we skip over them and go to the, the other generation so that the elderly person doesn't have a voice in his or her own treatment. Do you have advanced care directives? Sorry? Advanced care directives? We do, but again, I think we are in a culture that just, like, we don't talk about death. We don't talk about our own mortality. We don't say, what do we want this to look like? Uh, it's starting to change a little. I, I, we've made some good advancements with hospice in the U.S. and what they're mm. able to, to offer. Um, but it's, it's still this, this end of life situation is not communicated well, both by the, the patients who are being treated and, and the physicians who are doing the treatments. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I found so interesting in Still Alice was, um, and I'm assuming a lot of people here have read it, yes? Hands up, who's read? Yeah, a lot. Uh, one of the, the things that Alice, a task Alice sets herself, or maybe you can tell us about the task Alice sets herself uh, to answer certain questions every day and what she should do if, if, if she fails to be able to do that. Okay, so, so everyone I know who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, considers taking their own life before it goes all the way to the end. And it's not everyone plans to take their own life, and uh, many people, most people don't. Um, and yet I found it extraordinary, extraordinary that every single person diagnosed with Alzheimer's considered it. These, again, were people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. The average 60-year-old isn't contemplating, should I kill myself in the next couple of years? So I knew that I had to have Alice consider this. And the task she sets out for herself as well, if I can't remember these basic biographical pieces of, pieces of information about myself, um, then I don't deserve to be here. I don't want to be here. And so she, if she can't answer those questions, then she has directions on what to do um, to end her life. And she's been hoarding, um, hoarding pills. And so the Alice before Alzheimer's didn't know what the Alice with Alzheimer's would learn. And I've seen this over and over with so many people. And that, you know, we tend to think that especially for Alice, that her worth and identity was all placed in what she does, which was very cerebral, right? She was a Harvard professor, so who she is is being someone who can think and remember. And if this disease steals that, then she thinks that there's no point in being here. And the, the people I know who you know, have Alzheimer's, while the losses are real and tragic and heartbreaking, 
it's not everything. It, it, it's you are more than what you can remember, and that if I can't remember my address, I still, I still matter. And that if I forget, you know, if I were to forget being up here with you five minutes after leaving, that doesn't mean that this conversation didn't matter to all of us. Mm. So, so it's interesting in terms of approaching end of life decisions. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So it often has to be revisited. These advanced directives are great and it starts the conversation, but I believe that it needs to be a continuing conversation as things evolve. Yeah, Karen's totally very big agree. on that. And I totally agree. And in fact, the, the real reason that actually made me put pen to paper was that there was a, a, a new franchise that was uh, brought into Australia from the US called Respecting Patient Choices, where trained communicators were able to roam the hospital and without the, any of the treating clinicians being involved, were able to ask the patient to for, you know, fill out documents saying what sort of treatment they wanted, whether they would, would wish to have palliation rather than antibiotics or whatever. And I just, it, it really uh, disturbed me and um, made me scared because you know, patients are very vulnerable, people are very vulnerable, particularly when we live in a society that is completely outrageously ageist and makes, you know, has sort of like cut old people out of any sort of, you know, meaningful, well, I mean, not obviously cut out, but um, there it seems to me an epidemic of older people feeling worthless, lonely. There's definitely a loneliness epidemic. And if people mm. feel like that, then they, uh, if we make people feel worthless, then they want to die. And also, people uh, really don't want to be a burden. And so the whole question of asking someone what they want, it's really complicated because if someone says they want to die, I think the first question has to be, why do you want to die? And if, if there's something in their answer that means that we can in some way change their life situation to make their life bearable, then I think that's really important. Um, I, I, it's so interesting what you say about Alzheimer's because you know I get screamed down by people saying that they have the right now to say they don't want to live like that. I mean, I was on a, a panel at Byron Bay Writers Festival um, with uh, Renata Singer, who somebody in the audience said, what are we gonna do, Karen, about the way we treat elderly people in nursing homes and particularly those with dementia? You know, because we just like put them in these institutions, purpose designed to accelerate their neurological and physical decline, and then, you know, say, oh my God, they're so disgusting, you know, and it's like, because we, we don't even treat them like human beings anymore. And, um, and, I, and Renata Singer said, I don't want to live like that and I think it's my right to uh, make the choice now that I don't want to be alive like that. And the thing is, I just see it every single day on my ward, people change their mind. What you think now is a tolerable way of life will change. We are incredible at wanting to live and dealing with you know, decreasing circles of influence, what we value right now, you know, being able to bound up on stage and sit here and talk in semi-articulate sentences, might, you know, might not be sort of important later and whether or not we have the right now to kill off our future self, I think, or whether we might change our mind is a really, really important um, question. And if we sit around now and say, we don't, we don't have to do, the reason that we do nothing about these patients in nursing homes and patients with dementia is because we have this myth in our head that we would rather be dead than be like that and therefore we do nothing because like, we're just like, oh, we'll just make sure that we're dead. So I think that it's, it's, it's very, very complicated and I think that's a really important point. Mm. Yeah, and I think the unfortunate... Th th thank you, yeah. And the idea that those are the only two choices, right? Yeah. So the elderly, it's like, oh, you're going to be demented in a, in a place where you're not treated like a human being or dead. And so yeah. if those are the two choices, then maybe you were thinking, exactly. I would choose death. Exactly. And exactly. what needs to happen is there needs to be some kind of revolutionary change in yeah, yeah. how we hold the elderly and yeah. those living with dementia and, and what, it, what you need to feel 
um, connected and that you matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, Everyone needs work and love, no matter how far down the pathway of dementia you are. And, you know, we think the only way to give them dignity is death. Like, what kind of society are we? I just feel it's not like there's any option. It's not like we're giving them the option of a meaningful life, which is, you know, has meaning in the present and, you know, that, that they can feel fulfilled and connected to other human beings. It's not like that versus death. It's like sitting there with a tea towel for a bib with, you know, food smeared on your face. Nobody bothers to put your hearing aid in versus death. I mean, what would you choose? Well, it's like, what choice are we giving these people? We're giving them a, no choice. We're sort of directing everyone to... It's cheaper, quicker, neater. I remember hearing about, I think, a nursing home for dementia patients, maybe in Tasmania, that had little bus stops with chairs that you could wait, you know, and little, a little trolley that would come and pick them up and take them shopping. And is that so, I mean, in, the, in the Netherlands, there's one where they've set up a fake village, kind of like the Truman mm-hmm. Show, you know, where mm-hmm. like all the nurses are they, at the milk bar serving mm-hmm. whatever. And it's kind of, it's better, I think, than a sterile environment with 400 patients with this, you know, rotating staff who have no idea who they're looking after and the only touch that any person in there ever gets is when the nurse is spooning their medicine into their mouth. It's obviously better than that, but there's also something a bit creepy about setting up a fake village. Like, there's also... um, you know, you can make cities more dementia friendly. You can have smaller nursing homes where the staff are constant, where they have a, a real relationship with the patients and uh, patients with the residents and where maybe we reignite a sense of community and try and look after people. I mean, really, even out of self-interest, the, the way that we are treating our elderly population now is the way we are going to be treated. Like, you know, we uh, just deny the fact that we're ever going to be old. We look at these people. um, I would rather be... Kill me before I'm like that. It's just... It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. When we're old, we're going to want to live. You know, most people, hopefully. What do the older people you you treat, what what are they saying? Are they wanting to live? Sorry? The the, the, the patients you're treating, the elderly patients, they want to live? Absolutely. They're the ones who call the ambulance and come to hospital. I mean, euthanasia is, like, very hot at the moment, thanks to Andrew Denton. And I think that um, youth... It's a, it might sound very shocking to people, but euthanasia is, is not an issue in the hospital and it is not because doctors are not listening to their patients. No-one has ever, and I have treated thousands and thousands of patients, no-one has ever actually wanted to die when they say they want to die and I say why and they tell and they tell me why and we try and do things to make the life tolerable no one comes in saying they want to die I mean I think uh, the questions around people say doctors never talk to their patients about death Right. Well, on the hospital, that is total bullshit when it comes to the hospital because the minute that you step foot in the emergency department, you are asked whether you want CPR, ICU, blah, blah, blah. And it's a bit of a fake question anyway because if you're of a certain age with a certain number of health problems, there's no way in a public hospital in Australia you will ever get into ICU anyway. No way. And so um, we ask anyway. And if you say, yes, you want CPR, well, no one's going to do it to you. So... um, you mean if you're elderly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because it wouldn't work. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. we're under no ethical obligation to do something. In fact, we're under an ethical obligation not to torture our patients for no gain. And so, like, there are certain things that are pretty clear. And so there's a certain population of patients that have advanced heart failure, perhaps have, a, on average, a six-month life expectancy. I look after many, many patients like this. And last year, I, I just found myself having, again, a conversation with a patient that their life expectancy was limited. They had to only drink 750 mils of fluid a day or else they'd be back in hospital. And if that became intolerable, then we could help them with palliative care and we could give them medicine so they didn't feel so short of breath and stop you know, all these restrictions so that they could live out... You know, if it was intolerable for them to be thirsty 
all the time and et cetera, et cetera. And time and again, the patients would say, no one's ever told me that. I thought this fluid medication was going to cure me. And I was just like, what are they doing in those cardiology clinics? But then you talk to the family and the cardiologist and they had told the patients over and over the same thing. But we deny that we don't want to die. Who wants to die? And I think it's fine. Everyone goes, we're denying death. It's just we've got to stop doing this. It's just like, well, who wants to think that the end of their life is the end of their... Like, it's a terrible, horrific thing in truth. And... Uh, I think that if people, we use denial every day in, you know, to make our life tolerable and so it's, it's easy to blame the doctor for not telling the patient that they're dying but you tell them and they forget or, you know, forget because it's intolerable to think, for many people it's intolerable to think that their life will end. Lots of people want to live, lots of old people and young people. Here, here. Or middle-aged people, <laughs> whatever I am now. Okay, so I'm just going to switch, switch gears a bit so we can, I'm conscious that we're starting to run out of time because we started a little late. And um, I'd really like to talk about uh, Lisa's new book, Inside the O'Briens, which we've already mentioned is about Huntington's disease. Can you just briefly explain what it is? Yeah, um, because most people don't know what Huntington's is. So Huntington's is a neurodegenerative disease. It's 100% genetic. So if your mom or dad has it, each kid has a 50-50 chance of getting it. You don't become symptomatic until you're in your mid-30s to mid-40s after you've already had your kids. So you've either passed it down or not. Um, <clears throat> its primary symptom has to do with movement. So you have a lot of uh, involuntary movement, movement that you didn't plan, and it's called chorea, which is Greek for dance. Or... Um, a loss of control of voluntary movement. So if I go to grab this, this um, bottle of water, I might knock it over. Or if I, I pick it up and I go to drink it, I might miss my mouth. Um, the chorea is like, you know, I, I'll be moving in the seat constantly. I'll fling an arm up. My face will twitch a lot. Um, I might actually just rock myself right out of the chair or fall onto the floor. I'm just slurring my words because my tongue is a muscle and else I won't be able to speak co intelligibly to you. Eventually, I won't be able to walk or talk or feed myself, so I'll be 100% um, dependent on others to care for me. In addition to the movement problems, I also have co will have cognitive and psychiatric issues. I will have paranoia, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, disinhibition of rage, apathy or depression, disexecutive syndrome, which means I'll have difficulty using judgment and, and planning sequences events. I'll have uh, implicit memory impairment. It is a brutal disease to manage. We have no treatment and no cure. Is um, there much research being done? Hmm? Is there being much research done? There's a lot of research being done, but not as much as, not as, much as needed to cure this. So, I mean, one thing causes this disease is a genetic mutation, and it was isolated in February of 1993. Um, so just to give you a sense, in the United States, there's 5.4 million Americans with Alzheimer's. There's 30,000 people with Huntington's. So if you're a drug company, where are you placing your investment? And, and so it really just hasn't had the number of man hours that we need to try to solve this. But the scientists who are working on it are devoting their entire lives to, to figuring this out for folks. Is it true that you were a 22-year-old research student working just down the hallway from the lab that discovered that gene, the Huntington's? Yeah, that's why I wrote the story. I was 22, I was doing research on drug addiction and the, the scientists who discovered the mutation were right down the hall. And I remember thinking, my God, that's the only thing that causes this. They're going to cure Huntington's. And we're 23 years later, and we still don't have a treatment. And uh, part of, you know, I've seen this with still Alice and the power of what conversation can do. So you bring something out into the light and you begin to talk about it. it that's the key to social change that can then bring out a, a sense of urgency that something needs to happen and then the funding can happen and then we can get to treatments and survivors and we've seen this happen with cancer. We didn't talk mm -hmm. about this at once upon a time, right? We whispered about cancer's the big C. We mm -hmm. didn't even say the word. No one, people with cancer were excluded from community. Something changed, a conversation started, we acknowledged that it exists. So part of the reason I wrote the story is I wanted to get some acknowledgement that Huntington's exists so that you all know what it is. You recognize someone who has it when you see it. 
because all of that that stumbling and the moving around and, and you you get very skinny when you have Huntington's um your metabolism changes and plus you can't manage to get enough calories in because you can't get the food in and um so you look like a drug addict or an al or an alcoholic or like something's wrong with you but you don't know what and so people because we don't know what we don't ask about it we don't look at it we we don't like what we don't understand so hopefully the the book like still Alice has done for Alzheimer's can play a role in, in, in instigating a conversation that can lead to some change. Your construction of the characters um, in this book was so clever because of the way Huntington's does affect the body and the mind. So Joe O'Brien, who's the protagonist, uh, the father, he, he's a police officer. So of course, you know, having all these physical symptoms is, could potentially be dangerous. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, for anyone that this happens to, it's horrific. And yet I chose, I, so I set the book in Charlestown, Massachusetts, as a nod to those scientists. And Charlestown is a very blue-collar Irish Catholic town. And um, Joe's a police officer because as a police officer, you have to control yourself in every situation in order to protect and serve. And here's a disease where nothing can protect you and you're not in control of your own body. And so, and it's like, it, as a cop, you have to be brave in any situation, but how do you show courage when you're totally vulnerable? Um, and so this is sort of what he has to face. How do I, how do I live with Huntington's disease? How do I, how do I approach this with honor? Um, how, do I, how do I give the lessons of living and dying with Huntington's to my children who might all have this? Um, so, yeah. so there's four children, and of course they all have a 50-50, you know, 50-50 chance of, of inheriting the Huntington's gene, um, and that just plays out beautifully in, um, in their individual fears about yeah, that. You. And also in um, speaking about living with a disease and end of life, you know, Joe, uh, the father, is, you know, looking at a future of severe debilitation and contemplating suicide, and there's a beautiful moment with his daughter Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so it, like a lot of people with Huntington's, there's a high rate of suicide and there's, there's this jumping ahead. So part of the story is about living in the present and the youngest daughter is a yoga teacher whose training is about sort of quieting the mental chatter, the worry about a future that is, you know, you can't predict and just getting present. And a lot of living with Huntington's, the challenge is just skipping ahead to what's going to be coming, which is, is hard. Um, so Joe, like everyone with Huntington's, considers um, suicide, which for a cop is typically eating your gun. Um, and, uh, you know, Katie, his daughter, has a conversation with him that changes everything, which is, you know, Dad, we might all have this. And the kids are in various stages of deciding whether or not they want to find out, because you can get genetic testing to a blood test to find out if you have it. And um, she says, you know, you've, t you've taught us so many things, right? We've learned how to tie our shoes and ride our bikes and how to live with integrity and our work ethic and how to change a flat tire and all these things you've taught us. Like, we are going to look to you as our example as to how to do this. Like, how do we live and die with Huntington's? And so th that really sort of landed in him in a way that he could begin to appreciate that part of his role in this is, is to, to let his kids know what to do. Mm. Uh, one of the other things I found fascinating uh, when I was researching you was that um, still Alice in particular, and I suspect inside the O'Briens as well, um, is, is actually on a lot of medical reading lists mm -hmm. as a piece of fiction. It's on what? It's on reading lists, a a alongside uh, pieces of non-fiction about Alzheimer's. Yeah. Still Alice is there. Thank you. Um, as, as, a, as a reading point. And I, I believe you've got a story about someone who was prescribed it by their doctor. Wow, you really did your homework. Holy <laughs> moly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, job. I mean, that's so satisfying to me because, you know, I come from a science background and, you know, there's this, like, like among my scientist colleagues that were like, you're going to write a novel? Like, why on earth would you do that? And especially Harvard, they're so, like, intellectually snobby. And um, as, you know, you're doing this, like, soft thing, you're writing stories. And, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, for, that they're used uh, in medical schools and, and you know, it, part of the you know, hospitals read it as required reading, like, the entire staff. Um, it's really cool. Um, yeah, a friend of mine, actually, his name is Greg O'Brien. He was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Um, he wrote a book called On Pluto, which I highly recommend. But I didn't know him until he had Alzheimer's. He approached me, wanted to get together and, and, and talk to me. And I get these kind of asks a lot. Um, and I often can just offer the person some advice and maybe some recommendations and references, but then they're on their own. 
Well, I agreed to meet Greg, and, and he comes with his, his medical reports. And I'm thinking, oh, God, does he think I'm a clinician? Because I'm not. And, and so he he's, he thankfully didn't go through the whole thing, but he had a, a, like a dog-eared page of his medical report and wanted me to read the prescription that the neurologist gave to him. And it was, you know, Aricept, Namenda, you know, Statin, Baby Aspirin, Reed Stilalis. <laughs> I love that story. Wow. Yeah. So I guess, you know... Um, one of the great achievements of your, of your books is that they have helped create, uh, obviously doctors are reading them, so they're helping create empathy not only amongst uh, family and friends and the general community, but also amongst medical professionals. Um, and empathy, you know, is a, is a strong theme running throughout this Writers' Festival. Um, I think one of the things Karen rails against is um, the lack of it with the elderly. Um, is, is, are you seeing that starting to shift? Or do you think there needs to be a bit more work done on training doctors to have empathy? Oh, look, training. I, I, I'm really doubtful if you can teach someone. I'm not, I mean, I'm really not sure. Maybe you can, but definitely not in a five-step package that's delivered by whoever in medical schools. And I spoke in the last session that I did about a, a paper that was in the Medical Journal of Australia a couple of years ago uh, evaluate, it was a, they asked the medical students to evaluate their empathy communication skills units in medical school because it's all the thing now and they, they all hated them. They thought they were completely stupid and the title of the paper was they liked it when we said we cried. So you sort of, I mean that was what one of the students had said about their teaching so they sort of work out what you're supposed to say and then they just say it and I think that the issue with um, older patients is that uh, what I try and show through role modelling to my junior doctors and students is really that these these patients are individuals. You know, they're not uh, you know some homogenous grey group. They're they've all had you know incredible life stories, just as every single individual does in their own way, and they have desires and loves and loss and so just in small ways that's I guess that's what I and I think role modeling I mean medicine is a craft and you learn it hands-on you can't really have it delivered by a web-based empathy friggin package like it just doesn't work and I think stories are really really important actually in um, in a sort of Empathy is an act of imagination, you know, and uh, I think that that's what novels do is they, they uh, you know, they open your imagination. They, what is it, crash the frozen sea within us? It was a Kafka who said that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really true. So, uh, I'm, I don't know. Yes, we have a long way to go, obviously, and, uh, but I think that um, if we take that instrumentalised, packaged... It's just going to do nothing. It's going to make these little robots who pretend to have empathy. But it's a societal thing. Like, I'm not doctor bashing. I love doctors. I am one. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it's all throughout our society. Well, you all must read the quarterly essay. You'll all want Karen to be your doctor by the end of it. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. So um, if we... Can get a microphone. Is there a microphone? Yep. And if, because we don't have much time, please no comments. Um, just short, sharp question would be fabulous. Okay. No questions. All right. You Could can have made There's comments. one. Here we go. <laughs> I thought half of you would have your hands up. Okay. Is that? Am I coming through? Can you wave? Because we don't know where Over you're coming here. from. I'm here. Sorry, I'll stand up. Oh, hello. I'm going to ask you what might be a tricky question, but Who, do you think the fact you. do you think the fact that um, so few people believe in a spiritual life these days maybe has some effect with the way that the elderly are treated? and that maybe people are more scared of dying? Mm, Is that for me? As for both of you, either of you. Um, 
look, I, I actually, that's an, I, I'm atheist slash agnostic, depending on what kind of, what time of day it is, but I think that um, if, I wish that I believed in heaven, because then I wouldn't be scared of dying, because then you die and you go to this, like, marvellous place. But for me, when I die, it's, and I can talk about it now, I'm going to die, blah, 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 but I'm not really believing it. It's like only in the dead of night, you know, you wake up and you, just for that moment, you actually think about non-existence and what that is. And I think that it's really, well, for me anyway, it's really rare. And I've just got in the back of my mind, as somebody on my last column, which is about my hypochondriasis, wrote this scathing thing, oh, all this fear of death is nauseating. And I just think, oh, my, well, sorry for loving life. But I, th I, I don't know the answer to that question if the lack of spirituality is. I'd, I think if you were spiritual, you wouldn't be scared of death, but mm, yeah. then there's a whole lot of secular people that are like crazily pro-euthanasia and then scream at everyone else and say they're afraid of death, so I don't know.